Hello? All right. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Ian Chin. I'm from EPA Region 9. Um, I work on the tribal drinking water section, um, primarily um, implementing the Safe Drinking Water Act for um, tribal public water systems. And do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'll be presenting after Ian, but my name is Emma Young, and I'm also in our EPA Region 9, and I sit in our tribal infrastructure office. Um, yeah, so I'll be going over um, some of the new lead uh, regulations, as well as um, an old revision, um, LCRR. Um, and then Emma will be going over kind of funding to address lead um, service lines, as well as other lead projects. Um, and yeah, so kind of on this presentation, we're focusing mostly on the service line inventory requirements. Um, kind of based on the timeliness of it. Um, since the service line inventory deadline was op October 16th, as many of you may know, um, and also the LCRI or lead and copper rule improvements were finalized um, like two or three weeks ago. Um, so yeah, I'll get right into it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, just kind of some background. Um, the lead and copper revisions were um, kind of put out by EPA to strengthen the lead and copper rule. Um, and they were promulgated in 2021. Um, and the effective date was kind of delayed a little bit to allow for EPA to do a more thorough review of the rule and see if um, there are any things that need to be changed, which um, they had stated their intent to do um, when the rule was finalized. And so kind of that um, led to the, the creation of the Lend Copper Rule Improvements, which I'll go over on a later slide. But um, essentially, the all the regulations under the lead and copper rule revisions had a compliance date three years after the effective date, which was October 16th, 2024. And that is kind of important for the service line inventory deadline, um, as well as some other requirements that um, were kind of kept under LCRR. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if this clicker is working, but I'll just point it. <laughs> Um, so just some of the key LCRR requirements um, that were kept um, following publication of LCRI um, was developing an initial service line inventory by October 16th of this year, um, which many systems did do, and um, also notifying consumers by November 15th, 2024, um, and annually thereafter. Uh, to customers that are served by a lead uh, galvanized requirement replacement or unknown service line. Um, and there's another requirement that I don't have written here, but for providing a tier one public notice within 24 hours for um, any lead action level exceedance at a public water system. And that went into effect also October 16, 2024. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so just a refresher of kind of why this whole, um, these lead and copper revisions and um, LCRI were kind of put out. Um, basically, the, the service line is kind of one of the important um, facilities that is addressed under this, these uh, rule revisions. And so the service line is the, the section of pipe from the main um, to the building or where there's not a building um, to an outlet. And oftentimes they, in some parts of the country, were made of lead um, historically. And so when you have kind of corrosive um, waters that get, that go through the lead pipe, then um, the lead can start leaching out and making its way to the consumer. And also premise plumbing can be uh, 
a source of lead at the tap as well. Um, and so kind of trying to, I guess EPA's goal under the LCRI was, is to replace all lead service lines and, and um, galvanized requiring replacement. And so that's kind of some background on why we EPA is requiring a, a lead service line inventory um, so that the system can know which, which lines they don't know what material they're made of, or they know they're non-lead, or they know they are um, galvanized requiring replacement. Um, and yeah. And so just some of the deadlines. Um, so the initial lead service line inventory was due to EPA by October 16th. Um, and kind of the next deadline we have for systems is um, October 30th, around October 30th, depending on the, the final effective date of the rule. Um, uh, so that would be three years after the effective date. And that will be what we're calling a baseline inventory, which is the initial inventory also with um, the lead connector material listed for each service line. Um, and if, if your water system has completed the region nine's lead service line inventory completely, we, we had a column to include um, lead, like material of lead connectors or if they're present or not. Um, so if that was filled out with the initial inventory, then um, the system should be good to go on that requirement. Um, but if a system does have unknowns, we're recommending you continue working on the inventory before 2027 to try to identify those unknowns. Um, because if you want to get out of doing like annual updates um, to all the unknown connections, then if you're able to identify the unknown before that, then you wouldn't have to send out um, that consumer notice. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it for this slide. Um, and then just going over the types of, of service line materials that were listed in the inventory. So we have lead, which is a known lead service line, um, galvanized requiring replacement, which is a, a galvanized service line that um, was downstream of a, a, either a known lead service line or an unknown service line. Um, and then we have non-lead, which is a service line that has documentation to show that it is um, plastic or, or yeah, any non-lead material and lead status unknown, um, which is when the system doesn't have any records really for the material. And so it's listed initially as unknown and you'd be working to identify the material. And so kind of part of filling out the initial inventory that a lot of systems have done is kind of using this lead band date, um, which the effective date for the different states range from um, in region nine range from 1986 to 1989. So we're kind of using the 1989 date to, as to be conservative and say that any, any portion of the system built after 1989 is, can be assumed to be non-lead um, or any service lines that were installed after 1989 can be assumed non-lead. And so many systems kind of use that as their documentation um, to show that the service line was, was non-lead without actually digging it up. Um, and Um, yeah, I'll take, take a question now. On the back slide there. Yeah. So if we're from California, then it was banned in 86, right? Yeah. So you're going up to 89? Yeah, I mean, I mean, there was, just to give some like overlap for if people did install lead service lines like before, um, or after the the lead ban effective date. So um, these, were, these were by each state individually, not a federal ban, right? 
Yeah. So was there ever a nationwide federal ban? Because being a federal tribe oftentimes will default to the feds. So I think the, I would be worried about in California or Arizona or Nevada, if after those dates, the contract would be like, well, you're on the reservation. You don't have to follow the state ban. But was there ever a federal ban enacted? Yeah, there was a federal ban in 1986. Um, and so, yeah, one of my colleagues might be able to better answer this, but my understanding is um, we're kind of giving a little bit of cushion to after the federal lead ban to uh, in case there were like lead service signs installed after that date. Um, and also in Nevada, the, the lead ban wasn't until 1989, so. So, so, the, so the federal ban in 86, how did Arizona and Nevada get the waivers <laughs> to the 87 and 89? Yeah, I'm, I don't know if I have the, okay. the knowledge to answer that, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so this is, it's an example of the inventory spreadsheet that systems had filled out. Oh, yeah. So I filled this out. And yeah. It in to create goals. And one thing I would recommend that so when you have to the drop down menu of, of what is it, all service lines originally built, you know, after 89, you check like aerial imagery as built construction. You know, for us, it's a combination of those things. So I wish I could mm -hmm. have selected every thing that I did on it. Thank you. So on that drop down menu, I can only select one option, right? So it's either aerial, construction, IHS as built, other. So I, I just think it'd be nice if we could have checked all the boxes of how we determined whether or not we had lead. Because I was using a combination of IHS records, mm -hmm. as built, and aerials. So just, just a recommendation for the this going forward. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. It's a good suggestion. Um, so yeah, this, or I'll just talk a little bit about the last slide. Um, so yeah, you can see one of the columns kind of notes lead connector currently present, um, which is kind of one of the things we want to see by the 2027 deadline. Um, as kind of like an update to this inventory, but if you have already filled out that column, then that requirement is is taken care of. Um, next slide, please. And yeah, so just a review of the acceptable documentation under the rule. And these are all kind of explicitly stated in the rule. Um, and so if if your system still has unknowns, kind of this is the types of things that you'd be looking for. Um, if, if you have not already found them, um, and those would be like construction plumbing codes, um, permits, existing records, water system records, which include as built, which is kind of one of the main ways we've been seeing, um, kind of documentation of service lines, whether it's IHS as built or from, uh, a private company, um, and also inspections and, and records of the distribution system. And one other thing to add is if, if this entire system was built after 1989, we um, kind of let systems just use a satellite image to show that the system didn't exist um, 1989 or before. Um, and yeah, go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so just a little bit on the lead and copper rule improvements that I've been talking about. So these were kind of further revisions to the lead and copper rule after LCRR. Um, and these um, were kind of in the works after 2021 and they were just finalized um, October 8th, 2024, which was a couple weeks ago. And so there is not a promulgation date or effective date yet where it, when it's published in the federal register but once that date is available then the compliance date for the lcri would be three years after publication in the fr um and yeah there there are a lot of requirements 
um, kind of new requirements in the LCRI, but I'll mainly be going over this, the ones related to service line inventories, um, just because, yeah, because of the timeliness of it. Um, yeah, next slide. So, yeah, these are some of the the key new LCRI requirements. So, by the compliance date, which will be probably late October 2027. Um, you, the water system should review and include connector material in the inventory, which um, the categories would be lead, non-lead, uh, unknown connector, or no connector. Um, and also, if the system still has unknowns or lead service lines or GERS by the compliance date, um, then they would have to create a, a lead service line replacement plan. Um, and so we're kind of encouraging systems to, if they can, um, identify unknowns by um, 2027 would be kind of ideal case, but um, 2030 if, if that's not really feasible because um, kind of the lead service line replacement plan um, kind of under the rule designates a 10% replacement of, of lead service lines and GERS every year um, and we're not really expecting to see many if any lead lines um, at tribal water systems in region nine so um, kind of any lines that you dig up uh, or pothole after 2027 to try to identify them or replace them um, and you find out they're non-lead then you still wouldn't get credit for that um, towards the 10 percent rate per year um, and the compliance for that is calculated on a three year after the first three years so that would bring it to 2030 and so um yeah we're we're encouraging systems to try to identify all their unknowns by by 2030 at the least um but 20, 2027 if possible then the system wouldn't have to create a, a lead service and replacement plan um but if there are still unknowns um by then then the lead service line replacement plan would include uh, a strategy for informing consumers about replacement plan and program, um, as well as identification of any legal requirements um, that would prevent full service line replacement. Um, and there's there's some other requirements from the LCRR that um, I didn't have listed there, but. Mostly, yeah, a strategy for replacing lead service lines and identifying unknowns. Um, so this is kind of just a timeline for the LCR requirements. So starting LCR compliance date of 2027, um, there will need to be the baseline inventory that includes the lead connector status. Um, and Starting 2027, there will need to be annual updates to the lead service line inventory, as well as the lead service line replacement plan, um, as long as the system still has unknowns or GERS or a lead service line, any lead service lines. Um, three years after the compliance date, 2030, we're encouraging systems to identify their unknowns by then. Um, for the reason that I mentioned earlier, because um, that's when compliance will be calculated for um, that 10% um, annual replacement rate. And so assuming that there aren't really uh, any, many of any lead service lines in, in tribal systems in region nine, um, yeah, they might may not meet that 10% rate. Um, and then another requirement on the LCRI is seven years after the compliance date, um, systems will need to validate the accuracy of the methods to identify non-lead service lines. Um, and so that means conducting a two-point inspection at a subset of the connections. And this applies to any non-visual verification methods um, or and records from 1989 or earlier. So any any records you have from 1990 to present would would not need to be validated but 
um, any yeah any non visual verification before then. Um, we need to have a two point inspection. Um, and the subset of connections, it under the rule it would be so that you have ninety five percent confidence um, that all the service size you identified with that method are non led. So looking at from the rule is about 20% of the lines, um, but that can vary based on the system. Um, and yeah, kind of the main, one of the main goals of the LCRI is 10 years after the compliance date, um, all lead service lines and GERS in the entire US will be replaced. And so that's kind of the goal. Um, yeah. Sorry, uh, thank you. This is a wonderful presentation. I think this is really good work, what you guys are doing in replacing lead lines, first of all. I strongly support this. So all my questions are not a criticism, it's just <laughs> to better understand everything. Um, <clears throat> so let's assume we do this, I mean, we're gonna do this, right? So let's assume we finish this and we find out we have lead lines. Because I don't expect to find very many on in the Western US period because of the date of our water systems, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but then of course comes the funding apparatus to replace this. And I can't remember if EPA, are you not having funds set aside to help us replace these? Is this an internal, like all tribal <laughs> yeah. thing? And then two, let's say you don't, or you do, is this also eligible as something we put on like with IHS, with SDS, and is this something that SDS would fund for us? And lastly, I will just say that I think getting rid of lead is great because there's a lot of studies that show that lead greatly impacts the human brain and that a lot of studies show that our decrease in crime in the U.S. is correlated with the reduction of lead in, in our bodies, basically, whether it's pipes or gas or whatnot. So, you know, I think hopefully we do this and we see crime rates go down even further in the future in the U.S. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I think... Emma can answer, I mean, some of those questions may be answered during Emma's presentation, so I'll, I'll, I'll wait until then, but yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, um, yeah, I'll go to the next slide. Um, so just kind of like a checklist for if you still have unknowns um, in your inventory kind of right now. Um, so there was a deadline on October 16th. Um, the next kind of deadline would be um, late 2027, the LCRI compliance date, which would be to develop a service line replacement plan. Um, that is, if you still have unknowns by then. Um, if not, you wouldn't have to complete the, the service line replacement plan. Um, also, sending annual notifications to homes with lead service lines, GERS, and unknowns. Um, and notification to consumers in the event of a disturbance of lead service line GUR unknown. Um, and a disturbance could be like a kind of physical shaking um, around the lead service line that could release lead into the water. Um, and depending on the nature of the disturbance, it could require providing resident with POU filter. Um, and if the system has a lead AOE during this time, um, there's some additional information about the LSLR program um, in the public education outreach that's required, but um, typically we will provide a, a draft of the, the public education in that case. Um, also, the, the system must offer sampling at any connection with lead service line, GER unknown, who requests it under the LCRI. So this would be starting 2027. Um, so that's kind of another reason to to try and identify all your unknowns by then. Um, and the sampling must capture premise plumbing and service plumbing, which would likely be two samples. And so for this this sampling that um, customers request, the EPA does not make any kind of uh, explicit um, statement on who should pay for it. So. Um, it's kind of up to the water system, um, whether they will cover that or have the customer cover it or 
a combination of both. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So the shaking thing, that's interesting. Um, that's first I've heard about that coming to these presentations. I imagine it takes quite a bit to shake a, a, a water line. I mean, for us in Southern California, I, I would assume if we have an earthquake, we're gonna consider that a shaking event and we've sh shook in our lines. So that's interesting though on the shaking though, because if the line gets shooken and it releases the lead, is there a good chance that the lead can come back to the water main system through a backflow event is I guess we're more concerned about going into the customer's home right because they're going to draw water but if you have something yeah. that's shaking your lines hard enough I mean is have you seen that where lead could go back into the system um I don't have much information on that um yeah I guess it would depend on the the specific scenario whether EPA would require this uh, notification to consumers. So I think we would kind of take it on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, so. I mean, is there, have you ever seen identified stuff where it comes from the service line back into the system, into the water main? Has that happened? I mean, I'm sure. It I'm not sure. Have, but yeah, but I, I guess can, that's I also can... why EPA is pushing for backflow now right with a lot of our systems and cross connection control plans and all that yeah that is a complicated question we can we can talk after the presentation maybe um, i think it's great i just i think it's a lot right now i'm just gonna throw this out there between yeah. this the pfaf stuff going on i mean you're throwing a lot on our water systems like right now for small rural systems yeah I so i think it's you know it is a lot between this and the pfaf stuff and the PFAS, I think, is more difficult because it seems to be out there quite a bit more than I think this lead's going to be a problem. But um, yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you my contact information at the end of this um, presentation if you have kind of further questions on that. Um, and I can get back to you. Oh, real quick, last, last thing. <laughs> last for now. <laughs> I can, I can hear you fine, yeah. So th this is one thing I had a question talking about natural disaster. Because your rule says if the home was built after 89, but you're assuming the home is going in with the service line. A lot of the tribes out here in the West, we experience wildfire. So then what happens if we have a documented wildfire where we lose the home, but we don't necessarily know if the water service line was damaged and we built with the new home? So I was thinking about this when I was filling out my rule because we had a wildfire that burned the majority of homes on the reservation. It occurred in 03. So by the by you saying like, was this home built after 89? I can successfully say yes. But that doesn't mean my service line wasn't re-established or reused from the previous disaster. Yeah. So I just wanted to put that out there. When you say home, I think what you're really talking about is a service line. Yeah. Because you're assuming the service line and home come together as a package deal. But a lot of tribes in this area have had wildfires burn through and have lost homes. So they might look and say, oh, this home is 2010 rebuilt, but the service line might be pre-89. Yeah. So I just want to put that out there. That, that's a good point. Yeah, so in those cases, it kind of depend on, on the knowledge of of the operator and um, would need to to make a decision based on that. So I would think in those cases, it would still be an unknown where we know that the service line um, is still on the ground or, um, yeah. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And so, yeah, um, if the system still has unknowns, um, the next step would be trying to identify them. And this is kind of just uh, ways that we're having systems identify unknowns, um, which is first collecting supplemental documentation, which many systems have kind of done very thoroughly already. And so the next step would, would kind of be the physical verification or potholing. Um, and so a lot of times we'll try to separate homes into groups um, based on similar age of buildings or if they're 
Um, the service lines were installed at the same time by the same um, organization, like IHS or HUD or um, some other contractor. Um, and potholing uh, includes three holes per service line, revealing 18 inches of line each. And it should cover the both the public and private side of the service line. Um, and Emma will get a little bit more into the kind of funding to to do that potholing. Um, but yeah, we will assist in, in classifying those unknowns. Um, and if if future work shows that the assumptions that you made in in identifying those lines were incorrect, then um, a reevaluation may be needed. And yeah, with that, I'll pass it over to Emma to talk about the funding. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, so to answer some of your questions, John, I will be talking about our funding programs that we have, um, specifically to assist with unknowns and service line inventories, um, and then also some of our programs in our infrastructure section to address lead and drinking water. Okay. All right, so um, some of the types of funding and programs I'll be discussing um, are lead service line replacement funding program. Um, this is definitely our most robust funding program that we have in Region 9. Um, and through this funding program, we also have an EPA managed um, contract where we can provide contract services um, from record review to um, potholing on site. Um, and then I'll also be discussing our WIN 2105, um, which is funding that's through our headquarters, um, but we actually can work with our headquarters in dispensing that funding um, for applications that are submitted to Region 9. Um, and then I will also be um, discussing briefly um, lead testing, which is through um, ITCA. We have some representatives here today if you want to wave. <laughs> um, and this is done through our WIN 2107 grant, um, so it is funded through EPA, um, but it is done and implemented by ITCA. Um, so I have a couple slides about that, um, but if you have more questions, um, definitely direct it to them. All right, so Ian has talked in depth about the service line inventories. Um, these were due last week, um, but we do anticipate having a lot of unknowns. Um, a lot of the service line inventories that we did receive um, have unknowns. Um, so we do have a lot of funding in the region. Um, in FY24, we received about $27 million. I mean, we've been receiving similar amounts. Um, this is funding that's implemented through Bill, um, and it is for the removal of lead service lines or associated um, components or any activities that are associated directly with um, lead service lines. So this can be investigatory work, um, which is considered with the service line inventory, um, the identification of lead service lines, planning, design um, for the replacement of lead service lines. Um, I won't read too much more about this slide since Ian went over it, um, but to be eligible for this funding, um, it just meets the eligibility requirements for our drinking water tribal set-aside program. Um, if you're not familiar with that program, my colleague Nancy Sockabason um, presented at 10.30 this morning, so that presentation should be available to you. Um, and then some of the requirements for it are um, public water systems, um, water system must serve an Indian tribe um, to be in compliance with the national primary drinking water regulations. Um, and then unless it is a compliance activity um, that's being done with the funding, um, then the system uh, must have adequately trained and certified operators. And this is for construction. So this wouldn't be applicable for potholing or any of the investigatory work. But if you were to seek out a grant um, or an interagency agreement to do replacement project, then you would need to meet that requirement. Um, and then the system must have or be able to develop technical, managerial, and financial capacity. All right. So there are two like main funding categories that can be used. Um, the first one is for the service line inventory project. Um, this is considered investigatory work. Um, so this would be the development and completion of service line inventories. Um, even though the deadline did pass, and even if we have received a service line inventory, um, it's still eligible for investigatory work. Um, like Ian mentioned, there's a lot of requirements for the unknowns, and they're essentially treated as 
lead service lines. Um, so we do want to help systems um, make sure that they are identifying those um, and doing the work so that you don't have to send out consumer, consumer notifications um, or send out more information to your tribes. Um, the other portion of funding um, or other project kind of silo is for the lead service line replacement projects. Um, these are considered construction projects. Um, this would be for replacement of, le of lead service lines, GERS, or unknowns. Um, we can also assist with um, planning documents for replacement projects, um, but this would be construction, um, which can only be done through a grant or an interagency agreement. Okay, so this is kind of our proposed process for utilizing the funding um, specifically to the service line inventories. Um, the first kind of portion, um, this kind of shows um, in kind of more words in depth, um, the slide that I just showed, but the service line inventories, investigatory work, um, which is eligible for a direct grant or can also be done through contract services, um, which I'll also talk about more in depth. Um, but this can be contract services that's record review to assist the tribe. Um, if you're having, if you have a lot of documentation which is required for the service line inventories um, and then potholing services. So having someone, a contractor come out and do the potholing to do the visual inspection of the service lines. Um, and then they can also assist with um, any other deliverables that would be that would assist the tribe um, in terms of records for um, the service line inventories. All right, and then this is for the lead service line replacement planning or construction projects. Um, so this would come after all of the unknowns are identified, either as lead or non-lead or GERS. Um, for lead service line replacement planning projects, this is also something that can be done through our EPA managed contract. Um, and it's also something that we can assist with through a grant. Um, for the construction projects, we do need a planning document so we can assist with um, the development of that. Um, but for lead service line replacement projects, I don't think that we have any of them in the region at this point. Um, but once we do, that would be um, a system that has identified all the unknowns um, with a confirmed lead or GER that needs replacement. Um, and the replacement for those would be um, the entire service line, so both on the utility side and on um, the privately owned side. Um, and for the construction projects, um, this can only be done via a grant or an interagency agreement. So if you are planning on working with Indian Health Services for that, um, make sure that that's a conversation. Um, we're also asking systems to let their program manager at EPA know just so that we can start um, working on what that project would be and bringing in um, the right resources. Okay, and this is probably the biggest um, and newest thing that we do have in Region 9. So we do have contract services. Um, so this is a contract that EPA manages, um, and then we will work with systems that are interested. Um, at this point in time, most of the assistance that has been requested of EPA Region 9 is to do potholing, um, to have contractors come out and do the actual visual inspections. Um, and so this is done in coordination with um, EPA Region 9, our project officers, our program managers, the tribe, and then our contractor. Um, so this, um, for the application for this, it's a simple proposal form. Um, the next slide will have a QR code if you're interested. Um, and then it doesn't require a budget or a cost estimate. Um, that's something that we work on with the contractor. Um, it's entirely managed by EPA. Um, so if there are low resources or capacity issues, um, this is a really good way to address unknowns. Um, and we've, we've already had a lot of interest um, from tribes in Region 9 um, to do this specifically for the potholing. Um, and the deliverables for this can include GIS locations, mapping, um, report of findings, and then um, they'll work to update the service line inventory to identify the unknowns and we'll update it in our database. Um, so if you are 
interested in this or if there are other deliverables that you're interested in, that's definitely something we can all talk about. Um, or you can, my contact information will be at the end. Um, so definitely feel free to reach out. Um, and then I just have a little notice there. Um, I think Ian talked about it in depth um, about 2027 and the requirement of a replacement plan if there are unknowns. So we're really trying to get these services um, and these resources out um, to help um, the systems that we work with to avoid um, additional reporting and consumer notifications um, for unknowns, especially if we don't expect them to be led. Okay, this is probably the most important slide. <laughs> if you are interested um, in funding opportunities um, through EPA Region 9, um, this QR code will take you to our lead service line replacement funding page. It has everything I just said to you. Um, so hopefully that's more digestible. Um, for all the grant interagency proposals um, or anyone that's interested in the contract services, um, we have a very simplified project proposal form. Um, and then we will just need tribal endorsement. And then for the grants and IAs, and we will need a cost estimate. And then for any projects that are the construction replacement projects, and we will need a planning document. Um, and if you do um, find lead or you are anticipating a replacement project, um, the creation of the planning document that can be used for the actual construction, that's something that we can do also through our contract services that we have. Um, so, and below that is the URL. Um, so I think that this should be available on Excel events. Um, and also, unlike a lot of our other programs um, in my section, this is accepted on a rolling basis. Um, so there's no deadline, no cutoff. Um, we accept applications as they come. So um, the service line inventories were due earlier this month. Um, we're seeing a lot of systems coming to us with a lot of unknowns. Um, so there's no, no deadline. Um, you can apply, you can contact your project officer, your program manager. Um, we all um, have these resources. So I um, definitely encourage you to reach out to us. Um, and then the next couple slides I have are on other lead funding that we have in the region that can also be used for this. Um, but I definitely want to stress that we have a lot of funding for this. Um, like I said, we received $27 million for this this year. Um, and we anticipate um, receiving similar funding amounts um, while we're receiving the bill allocations. Okay, um, so I think my colleague briefly talked about this um, this morning as well, um, but in case you missed it, um, this is for our WIN 2105 program. Um, so assistance under this program will support projects and activities that address lead reduction um, in tribal public water systems. Um, this can be used for the replacement of lead service lines um, for testing, planning, or other relevant activities um, to address um, or identify conditions that contribute to increased concentration of lead in drinking water. Um, it can also be used as assistance to low-income homeowners to replace privately owned um, portion of lead service lines. Um, the requirements for this are that it must be uh, must serve a tribal community, and it can only be awarded through an interagency agreement. Um, so for the applications for these, um, when we do our drinking water tribal set aside solicitation process, um, when we receive applications, if they meet the requirements for this, um, we will put it forward to our headquarters office um, and submit it for you. So if you do have projects um, that you are planning on submitting, um, definitely encourage you to submit them. Um, we'll do kind of the background work to make sure that it gets shuffled to the right um, funding source. But if you also have um, any projects that you think meet these requirements, then um, definitely reach out to your project officer. Um, so we did have a successful, um, we did have a successful project this last fiscal year, um, 2024. Um, so there was a lead tank replacement project. Um, so the project was submitted to EPA um, with documentation, which was um, a sample sampling of lead that showed lead in the paint coating of the tank. Um, and it was submitted to us as kind of our routine solicitation process. Um, 
and we identified it as a potential candidate for the WIN 2105 program. Um, so we were able to send it to our headquarters and to receive the funding um, for the project. Um, and it was awarded through an interagency agreement with Indian Health Services. Okay, so um, we also have the ITCA-led testing program. Um, so this program um, is through um, the uh, Pacific Southwest, so it includes all tribes that are in Region 9 and also includes um, New Mexico. Um, and so this is work that ITCA does um, for the implementation of the three T's um, for training, testing, and taking action in lead reduction programs for school and child care facilities um, at federally recognized tribes um, within the Pacific Southwest. Um, ITCA will collect non-regulatory drinking water samples um, at schools and child care facilities um, and arrange for the samples to be analyzed. Um, all work that's associated with this is um, funded through our WIN 2107 program. Um, and if there are any questions, I encourage you to reach out to the folks in the back. Um, the participation process um, is simple. Um, you'll select what your goals are with being a participant in it. Um, and then they'll need consensus from a governing body, um, the local education administration, board or tribal council. Um, and then you'll work to schedule a site visit. And this is my last slide. John, I can get to your question afterwards. Um, and then this is the contact information um, for ITCA. And they're also here in the room. Um, so I definitely encourage you, if you're interested, to take a picture of this um, or to reach out to them. Um, and then this is the contact information for Ian and I, if you have any questions. All right, so a few questions. On the lead testing, so you can test for lead then, right? Through water samples, that's what you're saying? For um, school and childcare facilities, and I will also let ITCA. Well, if you could test for it, those facilities, if I have potential unknown homes, couldn't I just do a water sample test on the home rather than digging it up? No, so for the um, service line inventory, lead samples aren't um, a sufficient form of documentation for us. Um, and that's, mo that's based off of those leaching events where the lead can become untrapped and come out. So, okay. so let's say I do want to take a sample, though, mm -hmm. for my own, because I think there might be a lead service line there, right? Then, but you're not going to accept that? If it, because if, what if I shake my line really hard? <laughs> Um, are you talking about in terms of like sample results t for the service line inventory or just for? Well, to know if that line might have lead in it before I go dig it up and, you know, I mean, I just would think like, you know, sampling is a very non-intrusive event to a homeowner who might have a lead service line or may not, especially if it's a home that has a line that's covered by concrete or asphalt. Because if I'm going in and breaking concrete and asphalt, that means I'm going back in and repairing that concrete and asphalt for that residential home. So I guess it's just a way to kind of figure out whether the, the juice is or the, you know, it's worth the squeeze for me to go in and do that. Yeah, and then real quick, the one other thing I had though. <laughs> okay, sorry. The other one that I had on this was, um, oh man, now I lost my train of thought on the lead service that I was gonna mention. Oh well. That, yeah, I can ask you. But, oh, I remember now. <laughs> so our reservation is non-contiguous, semi-checkerboarded. I have some homes that aren't on my water system but are on a utility, like a San Diego County utility system. Are they, I'm assuming they're responsible for those homes because they're not on my system, but they're on the reservation. So who's responsible for those lead service lines? And assuming it's the utility and not me, are they going out and checking those homes for lead service lines? And then are they eligible for funds to replace those lead service lines? Like they're not part of my system, but they're still, you know, tribal members and tribal residents on the reservation. So I don't want to just leave them in the gray area if they have lead in their service lines. 
Yeah, sounds it's, like it would be great for you to have an individual conversation. Yeah. I'm also <laughs> going to bring the mic back there if you all have any comments to his questions. But go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, I would say the, I mean, the non-tribal utility would be the one that is um, doing the service on inventory, so. Are you regulating those ones, then? That would. Well, EPA is, but that would be under the state. Yeah, that would be under the state. for our funding now. Okay, but they're eligible for funding, okay. If they're tribal homes, they're eligible, eligible for our funding. Despite them being on a utility. That's right. Okay, that's what I really wanted to know. Yeah. So. Oh, um, I was just going to add that uh, we only test schools in uh, tribal education agencies. So even if it's like a small uh, daycare that's ran out of a home, we can test that water. But we are uh, we're not um, eligible to test like homes. Um, and then also another thing that I learned at one of our events earlier this year was that some tribes, uh, the homes belong to the homeowners, but the tribe still owns the entire land. So uh, some of the operators that we talked to at the operator work group meeting stated that they could go into the home um, and test or like see the pipes in the home for the lead service line replacement because um, the entire property essentially belonged to the tribe. So depends on like what your tribe looks like or it's a case, case by case basis like they stated, but maybe there's some type of creative solution that you could come up with, but that's all I have. Thank you. All right, and then if you are interested, we do have our Tribal Drinking Water Conference that's coming up in April. Um, we'll also be presenting um, further on the uh, lead and copper roll um, updates um, and other things. So please take a picture of this and scan the QR code if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you.